What do I know? <laughs> Thank you very much. It's Clay Schulte. Clay Schulte. Not that it matters. I go to, I go by a lot of names, I guess. Well, let me turn this on here. Welcome everybody to the 2019 Feast of Tabernacles. What a great time my family is having. And I would have a greater time if I could get this turned on here. There it goes. Okay. There we go. Well, good to see y'all. I really appreciate uh, that we're here. Uh, we've had a really a good time. Here we are the third day already that quick. And one thing I want to say, two things I want to say. Roger, I appreciate your intro, wherever you're at, that you said, listen to the words and not my voice. Well, that's what I'm going to say. I'm going to ask you to listen to what I say and not listen to me, per se, how I speak. I'm not a professional speaker. We've had some great speakers up here, but it is really a privilege and an honor. And the second and the last thing I want to say, I'm in a room full of so many, all these people that are in Christ. But there's one extra special person here. And that's a little five-foot brunette back there at that round table. So I have to ask her, can you hear me clearly, Diane? Okay, well, she just put her hand, her hand in her face, so I guess, uh, I guess that means yes. All right. Good morning once again. I'm going to start here. Where would be we be without history? Think of the mistakes we would make if it weren't for history's ability to teach us on a consistent basis. And think of the blessings and instructions that history all by itself has taught us in the praise and worship and the intimacy of our God. To think that both positive and negative history are like windfalls for those who will take advantage of their guidance. Thankfully for us, as I ask you to turn to Psalm 102, thankfully for us, our God has used history, biblical history specifically, for our advantage. He made sure the essential events were chronicled so we could receive, weigh, and learn from him. So let's look at some of those in Psalm 102, verse 27. I'm going to read. I'm going to go through a whirlwind of scriptures here I think I'm not like skip I can't speak for 25 minutes and then bring the last bring one verse up at the end I got to use the word of God here often it's my strength as it is all of our strength so Psalm 102 verse 27 but you God remain the same and your years will never end the children of your servants will live in your presence their descendants will be established before you now drop down to verse 16 for the Lord will rebuild Zion and appear in his glory he will respond to the prayer of the destitute he will not despise their plea let this be written for a future generation that a people not yet created, may praise Jehovah. Now, these five verses were taken out of the specific purpose of the context of the entire psalm. But the spirit, the heart of what we read here is universal to all believers in all times. Now, biblical history has taught us that God is always able, <clears throat> excuse me, to say a lot in just a few words. So the three points I want to accent for this holy festival are that first, these verses say that the Lord desires a harvest of people, offsprings, descendants. He desires them so much that he recognized them before they even existed. Through the psalmist, he calls them people not yet born. Second, he desires praise from them, as stated in verse 18. The Hebrew word for praise is halal, H-A-L-A-L. -A and halal is Strong's word 1984. It's the root word 
for our English word, obviously, hallelujah. Halal means to be just the root, means to be clear, to shine, to boast, to show, to rave, to celebrate, and to be clamorously, clamorously foolish. It's telling that the Hebrews use this base word considering its meaning to describe for us this generation yet to come, this unborn generation yet to come, how to praise the Lord. They thought in their praise that the Lord was worthy of boasting on, raving over, <clears throat> even celebrating at times in an unorthodox way. Can you say David bringing home the ark? And third, but the most profound concept for all believers is what he states in verse 28. Now let's grab onto this verse with both hands. This is my focus of my short message here. He desires for all his people, even those not yet born, to be in his presence. To be in his presence. Just a reminder, none of us here were born yet when this was written. Could he be talking to you and me? If you are following along, please turn to an opportune, often sought Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23. Now, there are two shining jewels in these verses that I just love to attract attention to on his Feast of Tabernacles. So let's start out in Leviticus 23, verse 39. So beginning with the 15th day of the seventh month, after you have gathered the crops of the land, celebrate the festival unto the Lord. He is the focus. For seven days... The first day is a day of Sabbath rest, and the eighth day also is a day of Sabbath rest. On the first day, you are to take branches of, from luxuriant trees, from palms, willows, and other leafy trees, and rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Rejoice before. I want to break those two words down. I think you'll find them interesting. At least to me, they just blew me away when I realized what I read there a few years back. And maybe it's something that people have said hundreds of times, and you know how it is for sometimes that you hear something or you read something in the Scriptures and you just don't see it. And somewhere down the line later on, by continuous use and continuously being in the Word, you see it, and you have that famous aha moment, and you say, as, you, as we all often do, i never seen that before. So I had an aha moment, I guess you could say. Rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. So the first jewel is the word before. And if you're taking notes, as my wife is diligently back there, it's Strong's Hebrew word 6440. It's ponim. i got to take a drink here. Excuse me, thank you. You know what it means? It means the face. Before, the word means the face. So interesting. We're talking about the face of the Lord God. He said before in the verse in Hebrews, in Leviticus 23, Rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Now, I don't care how many years a person has been observing the Feast of Tabernacles or any of the holy days or the Sabbaths. By the way, this is my 31st feast. I remember my first feast was in Wagner, Western Hills Guest Ranch. And at that time, I was just a rookie I didn't even know what I was doing. I'd just been baptized. I sat in the very last row and went, and there was four or 500 people there. It, let's put it this way. It was packed. 
And as I sat there, it was, everything was on the same level. Maybe the speaker was just up, maybe on a small pedestal. But you, all you had to stretch like this. And at that time, all I could see was a sea of bald heads from where I was at. Now I am one of them bald heads and proud of it. So my forefathers who were at that feast before me, thank you for those bald heads because I ended up being one of you guys. That's not why I sit in the back, though. That's not why I sit in the back. But it's so interesting how things develop over years. And uh, I don't want to go into the I could just stand right here and throw the paper away and just uh, talk about those Feast of Tabernacles. But anyway, let's get back to this message because this is very, very important. We're talking about the face of the Lord God. Now, I don't care how many years a person has been observing the feast. When you realize, when you completely grasp the fact that you are going to be at the Feast of Tabernacles before the living God, his face, there is nothing common, routine, or ordinary about coming here. It is something to get excited about. So when you have Christ living in you, Colossians 1.27, and the presence of God is that close to you externally as it is here at his feast, then you are in front of his face and you can come to no other conclusion but at the Feast of Tabernacle, the Father and the Son are rejoicing together with you. Is that something to get excited about? I would ask you to say amen, but I'll say it. Amen. amen. That's something to get excited about. You so many times you get up here and things come to your mind, you want to totally get off your message. So I, got, I got to stay in track, right? But Michael Daring said, Keith, I just, without paper, without a guide, I'm, I'm, I'm all over. Michael, we have a kindred spirit there, brother. I can tell you that right now. It's just, it's just the, way it, the way it is with with some of us, that uh, we need, we need uh, a, a schedule up here. We need, to be, we need to function with it. With God, your cup runneth over at his feast. But guess what? There's even more. Remember I said about rejoice. There's a second shining jewel here in Leviticus 23. And it's, it is simply the word rejoice. Reread it, the end of verse 40. Rejoice, but this time I'm going to change the word before. Rejoice at the face of God for seven days. What a masterpiece of word placement in the sentence. This is the very first time rejoice is ever found in the Bible. And it's found in in context, before the face of God, at his Feast of Tabernacles. I don't know. I look at the scriptures, and I don't think anything is unintentional. When I think of God and how intentional he is, and I see something like that, I say there's got to be a meaning. There is a meaning there. Rejoice, it's the first time it's used, and it's in context with him. There's something there for us. The word rejoice is introduced in the context of the countenance of God at his, and at his feast. Well, why might that happen? Well, my opinion, and it's just my opinion. That's all it is. It's not God's. It's mine. My opinion is because he's telling us that if we could literally see his face, we would see that he is rejoicing with us. That's off the charts. Because he is rejoicing. And for these eight days, he's rejoicing at a festival that's his. And I believe his testimony here is that he desires for us to understand this and join in with him at his feast because he is here, right here in verse 2. Verse 2 of Leviticus 23 comes to mind right now, and it cries out, 
These are my feast. These are my feast. How many times have the people in here told somebody, these are not the Jews' feast. These are not the Pharisees or the Sadducees' feast. These are not the priests' feast. These are his feasts. Have you ever bought someone a gift? Sure you have. My wife buys people a gift. And her biggest trouble with buying a gift is to give it to them. She can't give it to them fast enough. She gets a gift, she gives somebody, she puts it in that foo-foo paper and those, those, those different colored bags, and it sits, and I know she walks by it and looks at it, goes, I can't wait to see their face, I can't wait to give them my gift. We all are there. We buy the gift, we buy it for them, but we're so excited to see them receive our gift. In essence... The Almighty is sharing his gift with us. He's sharing with us what brings him joy. And that's these days. And that's people having an understanding and a respect for what he's given us. And that's why you show up here. Maybe you don't put that all together. But in your better moments, when you do, and he sees you do that, it brings him joy. It would have to. These are his days. So rejoice his people, rejoice in him being here. What a gracious God we worship. Please turn to Psalm 27, verse 6. Psalm 27, verse 6. And I wrote these pages in... Uh, my buddy Ron Salad said, oh, Keith, that's all you got written? You'll never get, you'll, you'll have to just impromptu this whole message, or most of your message. I just got that at the top of page two. So anyway, let's, let's go on from here. Psalm 27, 6, we're going to read three verses. So he can expand on this attractive invitation, this nearness to his very self. You realize that in these days, he is pursuing us in these days. Psalm 27, verse 6. This is the prophet David. David is a warrior. He's a king. He's a type of a priest. Situations he's in. And he's definitely a prophet. Here he's a prophet psalmist. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies, all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. Now, all three times these verses for face, the word face here is the same word as we read the word before in Leviticus 23, ponim. Our focus here, though, is that God wanted David to come into his presence. And David was only too happily to do so. David replied to God, Your face, Lord, I will seek. Now, I understand here we're talking spiritual concepts, physical. I know you can't see the look on the face of God and live. I understand that. But, I th but you know what I mean when I say this. We're on a spiritual plane here. And there's a depth of intimacy here that we can't miss because it imparts to us that we, on the face of the earth, are so 
privileged that it's beyond description. To live in the land of plenty like we do and, and, and to have the privilege of being before the presence of God during holy time, if you can't get excited about that, have the guy sitting next to you pinch you. <laughs> it's just that exciting. David had a desire to fellowship with God in whatever way God would have him. To enjoy this gift of nearness of God meant eternal life to David. And David confessed as much in verse 9 when he wrote, O God of my salvation. David was a warrior. And as Mr. Dart said on a few occasions, that David and his men wore their clothes out from the inside out. I'm sure a lot of you remember that. Yet here in verse 9, David was humbled because he knew this intimacy of being before God meant eternal life. I'm sure for David, seeking God's face never became routine or monotonous. Or something like, yeah, this is just something we've been doing for years in the fall with some people we know. Or, yeah, it's just a vacation we go on. Here he's giving us an opportunity to seek his face, to seek intimacy with him. Now, I know we're the temple of the living God. I understand that. But he's giving us something extra. He's giving us another opportunity. And when God opens a door for you, what do you do? You walk through it, don't you? You all are walking through doors to get here. Sometimes, some of you have walked through some difficult doors. But here you are. You think he doesn't see the sacrifice some of you have went through to make it here? That means something to him. Well, we've got three minutes. Now, if you ask someone why they attend a Feast of Tabernacles, the most common answer would probably be because it's commanded. Okay, that's cool. I'm sure it's always been that way for the majority, but the lesser, the fewer, the best reason to attend for us today is, as well as most of the Israelites, most of the prophets, and the psalmists we know about was because they just loved God. They just loved him. We read in verse 8, My heart said to you, God, your face, Lord, David will seek. My heart, David said, his heart will seek after the Lord, his face, this intimacy, this closeness, this nearness. They just wanted to be near as possible on this earth to him. They wanted to be where he was at all costs. The spiritual value of understanding that and the application for us this morning is priceless. It's priceless. That's why we attend his feast. This feast, every feast, that reason trumps all other reasons to be here. It's his presence with us. They had a desire, even a yearning, to be right there close by him. That's why they traveled to Jerusalem. Let's, uh, I don't know, I don't have the scripture verse Let's see, why they traveled to Jerusalem, I've got to get through this real quick. Traveled in four seasons to be near God's dwelling place, where it was the tent, whether it was the tent of meeting or, or, or by, the, the, uh, by David or the Salmonic temple. Now let's back up to verse 4, where you're at right there. Back up to verse 4, and I'll finish this off. Verse 4, Psalm 27. One thing 
I ask from the eternal. This only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, close, so close, all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of Jehovah and to seek him in his temple. One more. Jump over to Psalm 26, 8. Psalm 26, 8. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. This is a statement of utter sincerity by David. And sincerity is always a prerequisite for approaching him. I want to thank you all. I want you like to like you to remember that. And I want to thank you all for being here. You may help make Diane and I's feast special. We've been here three years. This is the third year. And this is the, well, I don't want to go into that. I need to get off, this, off of the stage. Thank you very much. God bless you. Be excited about what it is you're doing here. Is God worth getting excited over? Thank you.